Well, every, every second Saturday of the month, we have a men's breakfast here, and, and uh, I, most of those times, will give a, a short little devotional. And um, last month, I, when I was doing that, uh, some of the guys said, hey, you know, you should do that in a sermon sometime. So having just finished our series on what we believe over these last uh, several weeks and months over the summer, I uh, decided to pick that up and, and pick up the, the, the idea of the curious case of a secret Christian. A secret Christian. Uh, it raises all kinds of questions, doesn't it? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? What does that look like, and, and what is it supposed to be like? Uh, a lot of times when we think about a disciple of Jesus, we have the super Christian, and you're doing all these things, and, and our models for that are, are people like authors who write about such things, and, and pastors, and leaders, and, and others who, who really demonstrate what it means to live by that. And, and, and as we think of these super ones, you're like, this is what it's supposed to be. And, and sometimes uh, authors and preachers will, will, will lay it on pretty heavy that this is, you're not doing enough. you got to be more de- dedicated and, and this, well, you got to be more like me. And yet, we come to realize, I'm not like that. This isn't who I am. Well, do we have anything that talks about that? Well, I was reading a book by uh, uh, Larry Osborne uh, called Accidental Pharisees, and, and he talks a bit about well, a guy in scripture that we, we would sometimes just gloss over in terms of thinking about as a, as a disciple of Jesus, and that's a guy named Joseph of Arimathea. He only shows up at the end of the gospel, after Jesus has died. That's the first time we see him. He's not a part of any of the things that are previous to that, and he's only in the short little passage. But he's in all four of the gospels we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of them talk just a little bit about Joseph of Arimathea and speak about him. Well, so who is this guy that all of them feel they need to talk about? Well, I, I, we'll go through each of those passages uh, and, and, and get a little bit of a picture for who he is. First of all, we, we discover that he is a rich disciple uh, of Jesus. This is um, from Matthew chapter 7, 27 and starting in verse 45. Um, and this is connecting with the death of Jesus. So this, again, this is the end of, of his earthly life and ministry until he raises again. And this is how the story goes. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, Mary the mother of Zebedee's son, and I forgot to copy the whole passage here, sorry. Uh, So starting in verse 57. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Jesus took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. All right, so that's our mention in the book of Matthew of Joseph of Arimathea. Not much that says about him. He, he's a rich man, 
but he's also a disciple of Jesus, and that's what we have. And so he takes care of the body, and we have this picture of him. And, and, and there's some significance in terms of why Matthew mentions that he was a rich man, because, and, and this will be made light of in, in some of the, the other epistles that come on later on, but uh, there's a prophecy about the Messiah in the book of Isaiah, uh, particularly in chapter 53, which speaks about uh, the, the, the lamb who was slain on our behalf. And, and in, in verse 9 it says, He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Uh, so this, this picture of Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man who was a disciple, he's buried among the rich. And so that's part of why that gets mentioned there. But that's not the only time he's mentioned, as I said. In the book of Mark, we learned even further that uh, he was a prominent member of the council, the Sanhedrin, the ruling body that was there that was overseeing the spiritual life of the people in Jerusalem, the, the Israelite people. And, and so in that story, as we come to the end of Jesus, his death on the cross, Mark 15, 42 says, it was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, so as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, not just a member of the council, but apparently a prominent member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the in entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. And so here we go, another picture of Joseph. And, and I, this one is that he is a prominent member of that council and, and that he went boldly to Pilate's. He's the one who took the step to take care of the body. Um, but that's, again, just two of the, three, the four descriptions of Joseph. In the, in the book of Luke, this is what we learn. Uh, this is in Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 50. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man. Well, that's a detail that the others don't necessarily mention who had not consented to their decision and action. Okay, so a little bit more added to our story about him. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The woman who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and saw how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. All right, so uh, some more details we get about Joseph, that, that he was a member of the council, but he's a good and upright man. Um, that's that's not often said about different particular people within the scriptures, but it's certainly high praise indeed for anyone coming from, from Luke. Luke, as he prepares his gospel, his written account of Jesus, uh, set about to put an orderly account of this is what happened to Jesus and Jesus' life and death. he will have a second volume that will talk more about that in the book of Acts as, as Jesus ascends into heaven and, and the, the new followers of Jesus emerge and begin to tell the story. And so in his research, he, he discovers these things about Joseph, that he was good and upright, that was his reputation, and he hadn't consented to the decision. Um, we, we often get the sense that uh, the leading leaders council, this was, this was a unanimous, unanimous thing, that, that all of them were in support of it, but uh, Joseph certainly was not one of them. And then we have our fourth description, and this comes from uh, the Gospel of John. Um, and in, starting in verse 38 of chapter 19, later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. 
he was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. And, and so we get, again, a couple more details, and this one we learn that, Jesus, that, that Joseph was, well, he was a secret follower of Jesus, which blows away everything we think about what it means to be a disciple. It's like, how can you be a disciple? Anyone who denies me, I'll deny him. How can you, how can you be secretive about this? And then certainly, we would have some kind of, well, admonition to him for being secretive. But as we look at this text, that's notably absent, isn't it? That in each of these texts, there's no sense that Joseph was, was someone who was not fully doing what he was supposed to do. Uh, again, he's described as a good and upright man. He's described as a disciple of Jesus, a one who was looking for the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven to come. And in each of these cases, he is lifted up for what he did. And what did he do? He stepped forward and asked for the body. Uh, so secretive for a while, but secret no more, right? I mean, to, to take that step, uh, going to Pilate and, and sending this request for the body, he is now identifying himself, okay, I'm going to take care of this guy. He would have been noticed by others within the leader's council. This is the guy, this is one of us. What is he doing here? And we learn as well from John's gospel that, that Nicodemus, Nico, is, is coming in part of this as well. And as the two of them, Nick, Nico brings uh, 75 pounds worth of spice. Can, can you imagine? 75 pounds. That's just, that's, that's heavy, right? Uh, how long? Do, and they don't have uh, cars to bring that in. They'll have to carry that. Maybe they got some carts. But uh, this is, took some efforts to take care and, and, and present this and prepare the things that needed to happen. But, but the two of them, again, leaders within the community, uh, they took this step to care for Jesus' body. And noticeably absent in all of this are Who? Jesus' disciples, his real disciples, the guys who've been following him and walking with him for three years, minus Judas, who betrayed him, of course. And so, where are they? What have they done? Why, don't, why aren't they taking care of this? Well, we know from some of the other parts of the Gospels that, that many of them fled, that, that Peter was hanging around, kind of listening to what's going on, but when, when he was identified as, as one of Jesus' followers, he denied him three times. Oh, no, 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 I, I don't know. I've never seen the man. And, and certainly, you, no, no, no. And so who's taking care of this body? Joseph and Nicodemus. They take care of him. And in part, uh, they, they fulfill parts of the prophecies of Jesus. This place of where he's laid in, in, a, in a rich man's tomb. Joseph, he's up for the job. That's who he is and takes care of him. And why is that important? Uh, this is one of the things that uh, Larry Osborne talks about, that as he does that, one of the things that, that it prevents is what might have happened to Jesus' body. Because... You know, we think that, you know, any time there's a body, it's just taken care of nicely and, and perfectly. Well, not so in those times and circumstances. The most likely case of where Jesus' body ends up without someone taking it down and putting it in uh, a tomb. Remember, he was convicted and tried and killed as a criminal. And so the Romans were like, this is not a guy worth any honor or glory. This is a criminal. That's why he's on a cross. And so most likely he would have been brought to the rubbish heap, a burning pile, and laid there on top. A place that would be smelly and disgusting and, well, there would be rats and dogs and birds flying all about. And a body that was freshly killed laying on top would have been sought after by all that carrion. 
His carcass would have been there. The vultures would have been swooping around and his body would have been ravaged by that. But what would have been from his body? What, what kind of, how much body would be left to be resurrected? And so they preserve some very important things. They become a part of the story so that as the days that come when Jesus rises from the dead, he comes from the tomb and they know where it's coming from. And, it, and, and the other miracles that happen, the stone that is rolled away that these women come is like, what's going on? And they're wondering, where is this body? Well, they knew where the body was. I mean, each of these stories indicate as well that the women were watching this, where is Jesus? He, we know exactly where he is. And then he's not there. Joseph plays his part. He steps up in these moments, and, and again, the disciples are nowhere to be found. Maybe they're watching from a distance, but certainly not making, as the scriptures say, bold moves and requests of Pilate. I mean, that would be to identify themselves as followers. Who cares about a criminal unless they really care about him? Why would you step up into that fray? And there's Joseph doing that. And I say all this and talk about this because, again, sometimes we hear this word in reference to Joseph, that he was a secret disciple. Well, that's not a real disciple. He's not doing and living what he's supposed to be. We need to be bold and taking stands. And, and well, we do if that's what God has called us to do. But it's pretty clear that not everyone is called to do those things to do all of those things. Some are called to do very different things along the way. When we, list, when we think about Paul and, and his work, we, we see some dynamic work and we hear about some of his disciples, guys like Timothy and Titus, and, and they, are, they are leaders as well, and then Paul writes them letters to guide them as they lead the particular churches. But is all he meet was, was Titus and Timothy and, and Apollo and, and several others that are mentioned? How many other hundreds did he interact with who just took care of their daily business and lived their life where they were? They didn't go on missionary trips. Again, some are called to do those things. Some are called to be preachers and pastors and missionaries and to go into different lands, but some are called to, to something entirely different. And Joseph's call was to step up in this moment having been secretive before, now he takes a stand and says, can I take care of this body? And does so. Again, a lot of times we, we look at the big names and say, I want to be like that guy or that woman. Uh, we're going to have Dee Breston coming up this weekend, and she's fantastic. She's been writing studies and teaching for, for years and, and is a godly woman, and has, has, the Lord has used her in great ways. And... and you would say, well, I'm not like her, and you're not, and that's okay, because God has called you to what you have been up to and where you're at, and these are the things that you're supposed to do. You know, sometimes uh, you maybe heard the, dare to be a Daniel. It's like, Daniel was pretty bold and awesome. But Daniel was called by God to do something particular. And as we lead, read through the book of Daniel, he does these fantastic things, but he's led and guided by God to do these things. He listens to what God calls him to do. Now, most of us have, are not at jeopardy of being exiled from our country to some other one and then placed in some prominent position in a training program. But we are where we are. And sometimes the callings are very different. Uh, Jesus, when he was working with people and, and tell, talking about the kingdom of God, he interacted with all sorts of people. Um, in, in the Gospel of Luke, he interacts with a demoniac, uh, a man who is possessed by a demon. And, and in the process of, of, uh, of, of that, he, he comes and, and rescues him. This is from Luke chapter 8. Uh, so as they continue a ministry trip, they sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, 
He cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven out by this demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found that man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over the town how much Jesus had done for him. So here's a guy who wants to go and be one of Jesus' disciples, one of his followers. He wants to go to the seminary of Jesus. He wants to be one of his, his followers along the road and do what the things that the other disciples do. Let me follow you and learn from you. And, and he says, nope, that's not you. Here's what I need you to do. You stay here and you live among these people that you've lived among and you tell them what God has done for you. Now, certainly the impact of this man's life would have been tremendous for these people. Uh, what we know about that particular area is that was, it was Gentile in orientation. They were not Jews. And, and so for him to tell them about what God had done, particularly because they knew who he was, this is what, was a guy that was now known by all. He was, because of his actions, they had chained him up and he would break out of those chains and he'd do all these things that was terrifying and and seeing him healed and hearing about the pigs, that just freaked them right out. It's like, whoa, Jesus, just go. Get away from us. But then there's the guy. And every day they saw the guy, what would they see? That's the guy. That guy was nuts. He was out of his mind. He was crazy. He'd do all these stuff, and people would be telling these stories, and their children have heard these stories, and, and there he is, not nuts and telling people what God had done for him. That was his assignment. Don't go. Stay here. Be my messenger. Do what I've called you to do here and not come with me. That's your calling. See, the calling is different for all of us, isn't it? And, and so we don't have to feel bad or guilty about what someone else is doing because that's how God's gifted and called them. But to fully live out what he's called us to do in the place where we are. And if he calls us to go, well, we'll know that. He'll make that evident to us in, in, in the circumstances in our lives, in the people in our lives, in the calling we feel in our hearts. Otherwise, what is God calling you to do even now, even today? Uh, Paul says something similar in his letter to the Thessalonians. Uh, he writes this in, in chapter 4. Now about your love one another, for, an, for one another, we do not need to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other, and in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. And this part of the letter, Jesus is beginning to talk about some behaviors in their lives and how to live in, in godly ways. Um, and, um, and as he continues, yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, you should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. 
And so Paul's call for this particular church and this particular city is, is to live lives in front of the people, quietly minding their own business, but fully dedicated to God, certainly walking with him, and so that by their lives and as they interact with others, because people are being like, why are you different? What is, what is with you? Who are you? What's, what drives you? And they will be able to speak about their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whom they discovered. And that's the message for these particular people. There's a story, and I've told this story before. It's about a guy named Kimball. Edward Kimball was concerned about one of his young Sunday school students who worked at a shoe store in town. One day, Kimball visited him at the store, found the student in the back stocking shoes, and, and led him to Christ right then and there. Dwight L. Moody eventually left the shoe store to become one of the greatest preachers and evangelists of all time. Moody, whose international speaking took him to the British Isles, preached in a little chapel pastored by a young man with the imposing name of Frederick Brotherton Meyer. In his sermon, Moody told an emotionally charged story about a Sunday school teacher he had known in Chicago who personally went to every student in his class and led, led every one of them to Christ. That message changed Pastor Meyer's entire ministry, inspiring him to become an evangelist like Moody. Over the years, Meyer came to America several times to preach. Once in Northfield, Massachusetts, a confused young preacher sitting in the back row heard Meyer say, if you are not willing to give up everything for Christ, are you willing to be made willing? That remark led J. Wilbur Chapman to respond to the call of God on his life. Chapman went on to become one of the most effective evangelists of his time. A volunteer by the name of Billy Sunday helped set up his crusades and learned how to preach by watching Chapman. Sunday eventually took over Chapman's ministry, becoming one of the most dynamic evangelists of the 20th century. In the great arenas of the nation, Billy Sunday's preaching turned thousands of people to Christ. And inspired by a 1924 Billy Sunday crusade in Charlotte, North Carolina, a committee of Christians there just dedicated themselves to reaching that city for Christ. The committee invited the evangelist Mordecai Ham to hold a series of evangelistic meetings in 1932. A lanky 16-year-old sat in the huge crowd one evening, spellbound by the message of the white-haired preacher who seemed to be shouting and waving his lone finger at him. Night after night, the teenager attended and finally went forward to give his life to Christ. The teenager's name, Billy Graham. The man who has undoubtedly communicated the gospel of Jesus to more people than other in history. But remember in that sequence, there was a nobody, a nobody named Kimball, concerned for one of his students and visited him at the shoe store, told him about the gospel, and in doing that, became a part of changing the world. Millions have been affected by that decision. Moving forward, what can God do through you? Whatever you're doing. Some of you still work today. Some of you are retired. Does that mean that God has nothing left for you? I don't think so. Does that mean that you're going to go to Israel or to Asia, to India, to China? Well, maybe. Probably not. But wherever you are, God's calling you to know him and follow him in the way that you are. There's this phrase that's uh, bandied about these days. You do you. Makes sense on some level. It, it's, it's kind of the point, except that for us in our world, it's like, I will identify myself in the way that I want to identify myself. Uh, a little redirect on that is, you do what God has created you to do. God has made you. And he's wired you. You have passions in your life. You have interests. And you may be a quiet person, but still, you're God's person in his place. And there may be a moment for you to stand up and do something bold, like Joseph, a secret Christian, and had stepped up when God called him to. So where's your life, and where is it going? 
uh, the focus for all of us certainly is to keep our eyes fixed upon, well, Jesus, our great and awesome Lord. And as we do that, allow him to do a work in us. Lord, you are indeed beautiful. And we do thank you for the work you've done in our lives, the ways you've demonstrated. And Lord, as we consider who you are and what you've done and, and the ways that you've created us, the way that you've uh, worked in our lives and called us to yourself, may we uh, allow your fire to burn within us. And whatever places you have us, in whatever locations, whatever circumstances we find ourselves, may we be faithful in those moments to what you're calling us to. Thank you that as we look around this room, there is such a variety of personalities and, and gifts and talents and passions and all these things you bring together as your church, as your body, and you use us in very different ways to let people know that you love them and care for them because you love and even care for us with our problems, with our issues, with our difficulties. You can even love us. Thank you for that. And may we live out of this graciousness and re continue to remember the beauty you've given to us even as we recognize your beauty in this world, this universe, this life. Amen. God bless you this day.